Welcome back this afternoon to this public meeting of the United States Consumer Products Commission. The hearing that we began this morning will now resume. Just a reminder um, from this morning that we, we convene these public meetings pursuant to our statute, statute to uh, solicit public comment on CPSC's notice of proposed rulemaking concerning portable generators. We have two panels. We've heard from the first panel this morning and now we're going to hear from our second panel this afternoon. On, this pa on the panel this afternoon, we are pleased to have Mr. Joe Moses, Generac Power Systems, Mr. Gordon Shelby, Johnson, uh, excuse me, Mr. Gross, start that again. <laughs> Mr. Gordon Shelby Johnson, Jr., an attorney. Mr. Tim, is it Shively or Shively? Shively. Mr. Tim Shively from Fireboy Exintex. Zintex, Inc. I'll start that one again. Fireboy Zintex, Inc. <laughs> Mr. Antonio Santos, Manufacturers of Emission Controls Association, and Mr. Albert Donay, cons uh, Consulting Detoxicologist, Environmental Health Engineer, and Carbon Monoxide Analyst. I want to thank all of you on behalf of myself and my commissioner, the, my colleagues, for joining us today. Um, we really do appreciate you taking the time and the effort to get here and to share your expertise with us. Again, each of the panelists will go ahead and speak for up to 10 minutes. And once you all have concluded your testimony, I will turn to the commissioners for two five-minute rounds of questions. With that, Mr. Moses, you may begin, and I thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Joe Moses. I'm the Vice President of Global Product Engineering for Generac Power Systems. Commissioners, thank you for allowing me and Generac Power Systems the opportunity to submit testimony to the commission regarding the notice of proposed rulemaking on portable generators. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a very important issue that I can assure you Generac is committed to solve. Generac is a leading manufacturer of portable generators here in the United States, and we have the broadest and most diverse product lineup of portable generators in the industry. We presently have over 100 unique portable generator products ranging in power from 800 watts to 17.5 kilowatts. Our products are designed and optimized for multiple consumer uses, including recreation, general purpose, emergency backup, and construction. We produce portable generators that can be fueled by a broad range of fuels, including gasoline, liquid propane, and diesel. Generac has been an active member of the Portable Generator Manufacturers Association, PGMA, since the organization was founded in 2009. Generac joined PGMA because we believe very strongly in the mission of PGMA to develop and influence safety and performance standards for portable generators. We are committed to continuously improving the safety of our products. Generac's engineering team has been actively working to develop product solutions and standards that address this issue. We have explored multiple solution options such as reduced emission strategies and detection. Prototypes have been built and tested in multiple operational scenarios. We've been contributing many of the results of these efforts to the PGMA Technical Committee in the hopes that PGMA would be able to complete the revision of G300 as quickly as possible. We believe that PGMA has made great progress towards a standard revision in a very short period of time. Generac supports PGMA's approach towards addressing the hazard. Giving PGMA's demonstrated progress towards the development of a voluntary standard, we request that the Commission defer the rulemaking activities to allow PGMA the time needed to complete their standard making process. We appreciate the work CPSC staff has done to prepare the NPR. Although we are still waiting for the release of additional important information, the studies and tests that were published as NIST technical notes and CONTAM models have been instrumental for Generac and other manufacturers to compare the impact of detection versus the various emissions reductions. Generac is in support of the detection-based approach and believes that it will offer superior results when compared to the reduced emissions strategy that is outlined in the NPR. We believe that detection has significant advantages over the emissions reductions outlined in the NPR. These advantages include more life-saving. Modeling and testing to date comparing shutoff versus emissions reductions are indicating that nearly twice as many deaths could, could have been avoided with a shutoff approach. This conclusion is preliminarily based on the data and models that have already been supplied from NIST through the FOIA request comparing a shutoff to reduced emissions levels consistent with the NPR requirements. With additional testing and modeling, we expect to show that the shutoff approach is a superior method to reduce the risks from the CO hazard. In order to complete this activity, we need the second FOIA request to be fulfilled. Hazard elimination. Detection offers the advantage of being able to stop the hazardous condition altogether by shutting the generator off before the CO levels become potentially fatal. Alerting the consumer. The shutoff system offers the advantage of enunciation. When the system recognizes the hazardous condition, 
Not only is it possible to stop the generation of harmful CO, but it is also possible to provide an audible or visual, vis visible alert to the occupants, making them aware of the hazardous condition and notifying them to take appropriate action. Universal application. The shutoff system is scalable. This type of system can be applied to all types of portable generators, regardless of size or intended purpose. Generac has tested prototype sh shutoff systems and is able to achieve similar results on small handheld generators, liquefied propane generators, diesel generators, and very large V-twin sized engine generators. Emissions control systems are not available for and cannot be applied to all types and sizes of the commercially available generators today. No fuel source restrictions. The shutoff system does not discriminate fuel type or source. As a result, the shutoff system will apply to all fuels that are used for portable generators, both now and in the future. Today, there are no known emissions control systems that would allow the reduced CO thresholds to be met for many of these fuel types, and it is unclear what impact there would be as fuel blends evolve in the future. Faster implementation. The shutoff system can be implemented much faster on product lines than the emissions reduction suggested by the NPR. Our testing has already indicated that it will be possible to develop a single shutoff system that can be deployed on multiple generator models very easily. Emissions controls and catalysts will require complete redevelopment of the system for every engine consuming far more resources and time. Generac's product portfolio currently contains more than 25 unique engines. Retroactive application. We believe it will be possible to develop shutoff system accessories that consumers could purchase and apply to their existing generators. Generators used for general purpose and home backup scenarios can be expected to have service, <coughs> excuse me, service lives more than 10 years. Our estimates also indicate there are more than 10 million portable generators currently owned by consumers. Reliability concerns associated with emissions control and catalyst systems need to be understood and addressed as part of this NPR. Staff has been critical of the shutdown approach due to reliability concerns, but the same level of expectations have not been applied to the low CO emissions controls and catalyst systems. Reliability concerns must be considered as part of any rule or standard relating to either a detection or reduced CO emission strategy. The design choices that are commonly made by designers of engines and emissions control systems can have dramatic impacts on the emissions rates under various conditions. Likewise, catalyst reliability is also a source for concern and must be addressed. There have been several documented studies and field reports that support the reliability concern. Some of these concerns include Cold startup engine choking logic, which typically runs the engine rich, wide temperature range ECU map values in cold start conditions, operation at elevated altitudes, transient conditions that result from load changes on the engine, emissions control systems typically default to open loop operation when input conditions are outside of their pre programmed maps, the effects of engine wear over the life of the generator, catalyst degradation and contamination, oil carryover into the catalyst that can result from operator misuse or early engine failure, system mechanical vibration and jarring of the catalyst and oxygen sensor, thermal stresses that degrade or destroy catalyst operation. More detail and specific case studies illustrating these reliability concerns will be highlighted in our complete NPR comments before the end of the comment period. Generac also has many concerns related to potential unintended consequences that we foresee with a reduction of emissions as proposed by the NPR. Consumers may mistakenly believe that reduced emissions means it is safe to operate the generators indoors. It will never be safe to operate a generator indoors. The proposed rule is based on the premise that the occupants will become aware of the hazard and take appropriate steps to remove themselves from the hazard. There is no basis to support this premise. The significant cost increases to consumers that will result from this ruling could lead to consumers identifying ways of extending the service life of their existing generators and potential refurbishment programs. This activity was seen recently when the EPA Tier 4 regulations for non-road diesel products became active. This could significantly delay the benefits from a rule beyond the already long operating lives of these products. Generac has been and will remain committed to developing the best solution to this hazard. We believe that the solution is a CO detection and shutoff system for the reasons expressed here today. As our development of both the ANSI G300 standard revision and product designs continue to progress, we feel that this will become even more evident. We ask that the Commission consider a suspension of the rulemaking process to allow us the time to continue working with PGMA and others to fully develop and complete the revision to ANSI G300. These activities have made great progress to date, and Generac offers its assurances that we will continue to drive forward with the same energy and commitment in order to complete the process quickly. Suspending the rulemaking would allow us to share our efforts and avoid the unnecessary, unnecessary duplication of efforts that has been slowing progress to date. 
We welcome input from CPSC staff on the approach we are taking and are looking forward to working together through the PGMA Technical Summit activities. We will be providing more detailed comments through the NPR comment process as we get closer to the deadline in April. We have several commercial and technical concerns with the proposed rule that were not outlined in our testimony today. It is our hope that the FOIA request PGMA has outstanding will be fulfilled in short order so that we will have, the ad have adequate time to perform the remaining modeling analysis and may represent the results in our comments. Thank you for allowing me to represent Generac here today to share our thoughts. Thank you, Mr. Moses. Mr. Johnson? Yes, I want to, I'm going to start by reading a news story. Nine hospitalized in Alaska after carbon monoxide exposure. Dateline, March 7th, 8, 11 p.m. That's last night. It's on the monitors. It, the story begins, Anchorage, nine people in a small Alaska town of Houston have been hospitalized after being exposed to carbon monoxide in a home. The Houston fire chief, Christian Hartley, says the Monday night incident occurred at a home that had a generator running in the basement. And this is perhaps as significant as the fact there's a generator is the next paragraph. Hartley says a resident had left the home because of a headache and went to the home of a friend. He says that the two went back to the affected home and dragged the other people out. This is happening within hours of us convening today. Who am I? My name is Gordon Johnson. I'm a personal injury lawyer. That means I represent plaintiffs in situations like what might have happened here. Um, I'm also a brain injury attorney. I've been doing nothing but brain injury representation since 1994. I'm also a carbon monoxide attorney. And the reason is that the most significant aspect of a carbon monoxide poisoning for those who survive is brain damage. I currently represent in excess of 80 people in carbon monoxide poisoning cases. The reason the numbers are so high is that in many of the cases we see in carbon monoxide, there are multiple people exposed. One of the cases I'm involved in is a case where there were four generators set up in inside um, at a, a wedding inside and more than 300 people were poisoned in that event, over 100 taken to the hospital. I were also involved in two large-scale school poisonings, a bank poisoning, and I've done some hotel cases. I want to focus my testimony on three things. The first is why is it the statistics that we have, as scary as they are, as scary as this story is, understate the number and the impact of this, the degree of carbon monoxide poisoning. And when I talk about carbon monoxide poisoning, what we're doing here is we're trying to reduce the amount of carbon monoxide, which by definition reduces the number and the severity of poisonings. Um, I also want to focus on the impact that this regulation would have on what the general category of chronic carbon monoxide poisoning, which did come up this morning, and another issue which came up this morning, which is the full economic and societal impact of carbon monoxide poisoning. Why are the statistics, the scary statistics that in, in your numbers, why are they underestimated? They're underestimated for the same reason that instead of having nine people with a headache in this Anchorage story today, there are um, all these people hospitalized. Because when you get the first symptoms of carbon monoxide, it's nonspecific. The body is a carbon monoxide detector, but it's not a very um, clear one. We get the same symptoms we have with flu. We get the same symptoms we might have with food poisoning. I had clients who were in a hotel and thought they had food poisoning and, of course, went to sleep. Fortunately, they did wake up the next morning, but severely poisoned. Um, so the first problem is that the patients, the people who are getting poisoned, don't realize it because it's so similar to other things. And the other things are the kind of things that you might just lay down and, and hope you feel better in the morning. Well. If it's a severe poisoning, they don't wake up in the morning. Um, the other reason is that the medical people don't recognize it either. When they get to the ER, I would estimate it three-quarters of the people who have carbon monoxide poisoning never have a blood drawn. They never are told by the, the medical people that they have been poisoned. We, I know this not statistically, but I know it from my own experience of talking to hundreds of people with carbon monoxide poisoning. Most of the time when they go to the hospital, if there isn't some connection to an event like in Madison where they came in on buses, um, they are not, the medical people just don't think that. If it's in the middle of the winter and they've had a rush, 
a rash of these things, maybe they will. But most of the time, it's too nonspecific. Often, even when they know it's carbon monoxide poisoning, they don't do the right things. Rarely is there a referral for hyperbaric oxygen, which I believe statistically makes a difference in almost all outcomes. The second area is we're talking here now about a reduction, um, perhaps 90 percent, uh, I think your testing showed 93 percent. In the marine area, which may not be feasible for smaller generators, it's 99 percent. Is that going to make a difference? Well, one category clearly will make a difference is those people who have the chronic exposures. You could chronically get exposed to a generator um, that was too close to your house day after day, day after day. These utility situations would be a good example. Um, but the thing about most chronic exposures is they're not so severe that they set off the carbon monoxide detector in the body and say, we have something happen. Those poisonings can be very severe because they happen again and again and again. Um, they're not likely to ever get severe enough um, in this situation because the levels will be 10 percent of something that wasn't clinically recognizable as carbon monoxide poisoning. That's probably de minimis. We may hear some people who disagree with that, but I'm very familiar with the research in this field. I basically cross-examine expert witnesses and doctors, neuropsychologists, um, engineers as my primary uh, living, and generally it's if these levels are um, well below 10 percent, they're probably not going to be significant. They may have some issues, but it's not likely to be. I would analogize it to the situation that we have in football. The subconcussive hits in a career of playing football can wind up to be CTE, but you're not going to have a career of, of those kind of blows if you drop the carbon monoxide um, emissions by 90 some percent. It's just not going to get to be severe enough to make a difference. Um, the final area, which is an area that was touched on earlier today, which I probably have more experience than anyone else on the panel with, is putting into economic and societal terms the impact of a carbon monoxide poisoning. In all of our cases, um, our duty representing our clients is to put economic numbers on the impact. None of the people I represent died. Um, very few of them have carboxyhemoglobin levels above 30. Yet in almost every one of those cases, um, there is an economic impact that would include, at a minimum, a shortened work life expectancy, but also an inability to function independently in the world. Um, it's in many ways like we suddenly turned young children, uh, um, productive adults, into people late in life who need supportive care to get through day to day. And the reason for that is that carbon monoxide does much more than impact cognition. We can measure its effect on cognition, but like other brain injury, it impacts mood, it impacts behavior, it impacts the way the body functions, the neurological system functions, the heart and the other organs. The areas in between those functions, the gray area, it's not just the gray white matter junction, it's the junction between cognition and mood, the junction between mood and behavior. These are the areas that are most difficult to quantify but have the greatest impact. And in many ways, the only way to really take care of the survivor is to provide human assistance from another person. Careers are likely in many cases are affected because even if the cognition is there, the ability to get along with coworkers, the ability to control yourself, the ability to try to keep your remarks to 10 minutes is gone. The ability to plan, the ability to initiate. Those things have a much larger impact than just the economic cost of a shortened work life expectancy. A couple of quick points in rebuttal. There's a lot of talk here about now we're going to do this, now we're going to do that. I'm pretty sure when I read the materials for this proposed regulation that this goes back 10 years. Why, if the industry was going to make a difference, did it not make a difference over those 10 years of the 75 average people per year who died and the 25,000 total people we know were hospitalized and likely another 25 or 50,000 more impacted? The industry's had a long time to do it. 
As trial lawyers, we make a difference too, but we can't do it alone. We need your help. We need this commissions to establish clear regulations that will make the world safer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Mr. Shively, excuse me one second before you begin. Are there any members of the panelists who are doctors? I failed this morning. Mr. Dunn is actually a doctor. I know you're a doctor of law. Yeah, Dr. Weaver is available this afternoon if you do need to have any further questions. Of him. Thank you. No, I just, in terms of protocol and the proper uh, PhD uh, versus MD, but I just want to make sure I'm addressing everyone properly. Mr. Shively, you may continue. Good afternoon. <clears throat> uh, thank you for uh, having me uh, um, kind of give you a perspective from a carbon monoxide detector manufacturer's point of view. Um, Fireboy Zentex um, has been uh, manufacturing safety products for over 30 years. Um, we manufacture fire suppression, fire detection, um, all sorts of gas detection. Um, we, um, you know, we, we make gasoline detectors, we make propane detectors, we, and obviously today we're talking about carbon monoxide detectors. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, to share with you um, a little bit of, of what technology is out there and some of the applications um, that, that we have used the detectors in. Um, we primarily are in the marine industry, so there were some comments made um, earlier on um, about the marine industry, and unfortunately there's, there's not a lot of statistics uh, to support um, decision making. Uh, however, I can say that um, there's, there's several things. Uh, a portable generator, for instance, is a, you know, um, it's a, a unit that's running on its own and it has vibration and it has a lot of different things. Um, our products have been certified under UL 2034, um, which is a residential single and multiple alarm detection system. But then we take it to another level, um, and that is that we um, also certify it to the marine standard. And uh, the marine standard is a bit more rigorous uh, testing. Um, it's exposed to extreme temperatures, um, shock and vibration. Um, you know, there's a, a water resistance test, a splash test. Um, and the net result is you end up with a fairly durable, reliable product compared to um, an off-the-shelf residential unit that a lot of people think that they would like to use. Um, so, you know, in our years of service back in 2005, um, a very large uh, recreational um, boat manufacturer came to us and, you know, had requested because there were, they were having some trouble with um, CO issues on uh, boats that they provided with a generator where the generator is mounted in the engine room. Um, we developed uh, a CO detector with basically the relay shutdown feature. And so what happens is the CO detector is located in the salon area or the living area of the boat. And um, if the levels, because of station wagon effect and a lot, a lot of other things that happen um, on boats, uh, reaches to the alarm point, then what would happen is that the R unit, at, as it went into alarm, would also shut down the generator. So we've been building, you know, that unit since 05. Um, you know, tens of thousands of boats out there, not all of them with the shutdown, but most of them with a CO detector of one type or another. Um, and so that's one application where um, the shutdown feature has been used for many years. Um, another one is um, at the beginning of the uh, wars, um, in um, Iraq and Afghanistan, we had a tent supplier who supplies uh, tents for medical reasons, for um, you know the military, U.S. Army uh, purposes. They actually purchased our CO detector, and what they did is they mounted them on board their generator, um, and they also used our shutdown feature which if the CO level would rise, then it would shut down the generator, the source of, of, the, of the CO. Um, so those are a couple of 
of um, applications where we have been using that technology and shutting down generators for many years and you know we don't have specific you know statistics to say how many lives saved or how many incidences where um, it actually um, you know proved worthy but um, we believe that through the years that we have saved lives as a result of that um, we used in those designs for that, those applications, the, the actual CO sensor that we used was a metal oxide type. And, um, you know, metal oxide is an okay sensor. However, it is susceptible um, uh, to certain things that with an electrochemical sensor, um, the new model that we just came out with, we did an evaluation of the latest metal oxide and we compared that to electrochemical. And we believe the electrical chemi uh, electrochemical sensor is a uh, far superior um, sensor, um, improved accuracy, um, less susceptible to contamination. Um, and, and contamination is a big thing. If you had a metal oxide sensor sitting in a garage and it's exposed to ammonias and it's exposed to, you know, varnish and those type of things, it will absolutely kill the sensor. And um, in the case of if it's, um, you know, I, I actually uh, was painting or, or varnishing in my boat and the CO detector that I had, I left it in there on purpose, took it back to the factory, and what happens is it completely glazed over and basically would not sense CO whatsoever. It won't false alarm. It, it doesn't give you a, a premature alarm. It simply doesn't work. So when we developed our new CO detector, we, we chose the electrochemical. Um, that was one of the main reasons. Um, that sensor is also stable in different humidity um, uh, changes. So if you have high humidity, low humidity, um, different temperature ranges, um, and it's really unaffected from those type of normal environmental changes that happen. And um, the other thing about the electrochemical is that there's really no warm-up period that once it's powered, it's ready to go. Um, and it's sensing accurately. Um, with that technology, it has also allowed us to come out with a battery powered only unit. Um, so therefore, you don't have to rely on a source of power from the generator. You can have power all the time, so it's always sensing. And so during that startup period, um, it, would, it would be sensing. Um, and because of the technology of the sensor that um, it will last seven to ten years and that's maintenance free without without having to change batteries um, so you know we we just really believe that that it is a superior product um, and that's what we have incorporated into our new marine it will be mm -hmm. residential marine and rv co detector um, you know, currently we have been in discussions with a portable gener generator manufacturer, um, and we did a very we we basically designed a variation of the true UL twenty thirty four unit. However, it alarms at the same kind of levels. Um, so, you know, if the CO level gets to a point where it's going to harm someone, um, that that we can uh, shut down the generator. Um, it would be an onboard mounted unit. It would be water resistant. Um, we we um, have a way through software of determining if it's being used inside or out. So it's going to get away from false um, shutdowns uh, when it's in an outside and it happens to get a shift of wind that runs, you know, that blows a plume of CO across the sensor. Um, so, you know, in conclusion, um, as that, that story that he just read about in Alaska two and a half weeks ago, one hour from where our manufacturing facility is in Grand Rapids, Michigan, 11-year-old uh, girl died. Um, both parents are still in critical condition and being treated for CO poisoning. Um, and what happened is that they were, their power was shut down and they were operating um, a portable generator um, in the garage of the basically facility where they were living, which was actually a, a commercial facility. 
Um, but unfortunately, that 11-year-old girl is no longer with us. Um, I believe that if you had a CO detector um, on board that would have identified that there was high CO levels and you would have shut down that, that generator, that, you know, perhaps that, that young lady could be with us today. Um, so, you know, we really believe that, you know, it's a technically viable solution, <clears throat> that it's a relatively simple installation. Um, it is field retrofitable. It's a very cost-effective solution. In high volumes, we could be looking at less than $20. Um, and we believe at the end of the day that shutting down generators will save lives. Thank you very much, Mr. Shively. Mr. Santos. Thank you. Hi, my name is Antonio Santos. I am the Director of Special Projects at the Manufacturers of Emission Controls Association. Thank you for the opportunity to, today to come before you to provide oral comments in support of the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission's proposed rulemaking to limit carbon monoxide emissions from operating portable generators. We thank CPSC for its efforts to develop a comprehensive proposal that effectively addresses the risk of injury associated with CO poisoning from portable generators. We believe the Commission's recommended maximum CO emission rates for portable generators are reasonable and can be met through the use of a variety of readily available technologies, including electronic fuel injection, closed loop control, and three-way catalyst technology. Mika is a nonprofit association of the world's leading manufacturers of emission control technology for mobile sources. Our members have over 40 years of experience and a proven track record in developing and manufacturing emission control, control technology for a wide variety of on-road and off-road vehicles and equipment, including fuel injectors, oxygen sensors for closed loop control, and catalyst technology. In addition, our members have over 20 years of experience in the safe application of catalysts to a wide variety of on-road and off-road, small displacement spark ignited engines like those used in portable generators. Mika commends CPSC staff for its thorough technical work conducted in support of the proposed rulemaking, including staff's two-part technology demonstration program, staff's assessment of feasible CO rates based upon the EPA's 2006 technology demonstration program for non-road SI engines, and staff's testing of fuel-injected generators. Based on this extensive analysis, CPS CPSC staff concluded, and Mika agrees, that significant reductions in the CO emission rates of portable generators are te technically feasible for each of the designated generator categories. Specifically, CPSC's analysis found that existing emission control technology, namely closed loop electronic fuel injection, engine calibration, and a small catalyst, can be applied to the engines that port power portable generators to significantly reduce their CO emission rate to a level that is expected to result in fewer deaths and injuries when used in scenarios that currently cause fatalities. Mika believes the levels of the maximum CO emission rates proposed by CPSC for the four designated generator categories are reasonable and can be met within the proposed time frames for compliance. In testing conducted at Southwest Research Institute over 10 years ago, carbureted class one and class two non-road spark ignited engines 19 kilowatts and below with installed catalysts showed significant reductions in criteria pollutants with re reductions ranging from 50 to 70% for CO and 60 to 80% for HC hydrocarbons plus NOx, oxides of nitrogen. Mika member companies have been developing both precious metal and less expensive base metal catalyst technology for effectively reducing CO. The CO reduction performance of these cost-effective catalyst solutions can be further enhanced through the combined use of fuel injection and closed-loop air fuel control. Recent testing by Mika member companies on small spark ignited engines used a combination of electronic fuel injection and catalyst technology have demonstrated an 80 to 90 percent reduction in CO emissions. Mika last year analyzed EPA's certification database for model year 2015 non-handheld engines of the over of the over 1,000 engines listed, approximately 100 of these engines are certified with CO levels of less than 50 grams per kilowatt hour. Of the nine gasoline-fueled engines, all use catalysts and closed-loop control. The remaining low CO e engines are either natural gas or propane, some of, which, some of which use catalysts. Looking towards the future, several portable, gener portable generator manufacturers have already announced they will begin selling low CO generators later this year. 
Regarding the design of emission control systems for portable generators, manufacturers may choose to include three-way catalysts in the mufflers of the engines to achieve the low CO emission rates that would be required by the proposed standard. MECA members have invested millions of dollars in developing catalyst technology for small SI engines to ensure their effective and safe operation. Installation of catalysts into muff mufflers used on small spark ignited engines utilize basic manufacturing techniques and cal catalyst integration methods such as heat management and packaging, which are straightforward engineering challenges that are well understood. EPA and ARB test programs, both conducted 10 years ago, have shown that catalysts can be applied to class one and class two small engines without increasing safety risks associated with exhaust component surface temperatures. Strategies to mitigate these issues are available today to ensure the safe operation of catalyzed mufflers used on small spark ignited engines. These types of design issues have been raised and addressed every time the use of catalyst technology has been proposed for use on spark ignited engines, be it for passenger cars, heavy duty trucks, large non-road equipment such as forklifts, or small non-road engines used in lawn and garden equipment and generators. All of these issues have been successfully addressed for each application. Finally, Although it is likely that manufacturers will utilize closed loop electronic fuel injection and catalyst to meet the proposed CO performance requirements, Mika agrees with CPSC that the requirements of the rule should be performance based and should not dictate how generators should meet the CO emission limits. Companies should have the flexibility to determine the appropriate technology to use to meet the specified CO emission rates. In fact, the ingenuity of engine manufacturers has been demonstrated in the development of new advanced designs in class one and class two engines to meet the current phase three, tier three, small spark ignited standards without the use of catalysts. In conclusion, Mika commends CPSC for taking important steps to reduce CO emissions from portable generators. We believe that the application of readily available technologies such as, such as closed loop electronic fuel injection and three-way catalyst technology to small non-road spark ignited engines a cost-effective solution for reducing exhaust emissions from these engines and Mika is committed to do our part to ensure that emission control technology is available to meet CPSC's requirements. Thank you. Anyway. Thank you very much, Mr. Santos. Mr. Dene. I have my slides, please. And, <clears throat> excuse me, a consulting detoxicologist. In excuse me, is your microphone on? Sorry. Thank you. I'm a consulting detoxicologist and an environmental health engineer and CO analyst. I've been working on CO issues for over 20 years and I've worked with a lot of different kinds of poisoning scenarios and investigated them. I first uh, shared these concerns with CPSC staff uh, at the uh, summit earlier this uh, last year rather that the PGMA sponsored and I was the only one uh, with these concerns. I'm glad they're now shared by others and I think there's been a real significant change in the industry response. Um, I'm hoping that the commissioners will reconsider these concerns. I sent them to you in a letter back in October. Uh, first, it's been raised before, CPSC doesn't have the authority to regulate these air pollutions, but EPA does. And critically, um, they have been doing this for over 20 years. Most significant is that they have split their regulations of generators into very strict limits for large gen generator engines, just 4.4 grams per kilowatt hour if they're over 19 kilowatt, but much more, 610 to 805 if they're these smaller engines. So while an EPA compliant two cylinder 20 kilowatt commercial generator could emit only up to 88 grams per hour, the entire machine, an EPA compliant one cylinder five and a half kilowatt generator, a very common consumer size, can emit 3,800 percent more or 3,355 grams per hour. That clearly is the problem and it's EPA's problem. If they just extended this lower limit to the small generators, the small generator limit would fall over 99 percent and would be at 24 grams per hour. So CPSC is now uh, proposing to preempt EPA CO emission limits on generators up to 25 kilowatts. That's how they defined it in the proposed rule. So this would limit the smaller engines to uh, 150 grams per hour, but the CO limit for the two cylinder 20, watt, uh, 20 kilowatt engine would increase over 300 percent under this rule. CPSC would allow these engines to give off 300 grams per hour 
And that seems to be going in the wrong direction. CPSC as it says it believes lower emission rates are technically feasible for the smaller engines. So why not, if you want to go down this road, propose the limits that are at least as low as those already met by larger generators for 20 years? My second concern is this claim of a 90% decrease. We've heard lots of people hail it. It's a big number. I agree. But it's based on ignoring the cold start. All of the data from NIST ignored the cold start, and they ignored it for 60 minutes. In the rule, they proposed letting it go for 20 minutes, but the manufacturers wouldn't have to tell us what the maximum CO emission rate was, how long it took to reach this peak, what level of CO accumulated in the test chamber. All of these factors affect the ability of consumers to survive, because they're not going to start the generator in the driveway and bring it in the house 20 minutes later. When they start it inside, all of these emissions from the cold start are going to stay inside. And I ask you, you know, what this really depends on for success is answering this one question. Will low CO or safe CO or ultra low CO generators really cause consumers to behave better, to bring them inside less commonly? If they don't, if they still bring them inside, and I suggest they might be more likely to do so, we haven't solved any problem. There'll still be a very high, fast rise in CO. Carboxyhemoglobin will go up high quickly in the person's blood. And 5, 10, or 20 minutes later, when CO emissions fall by 90%, that CO level in their blood will not fall quickly. It takes many times longer to get rid of CO than to absorb it. All my colleagues who've studied this agree on that point. So we don't solve the problem if we miss that cold start. My third concern is this claim that the limits are based on technical feasibility. As I mentioned, EPA has had lower limits for a long time. Neither the briefing package or the proposed rule mentioned that these ostensibly technology-based limits of 75, 50, and 300 grams per hour, depending on the size of the generator, are almost identical to a completely different set of numbers. To EPA's 2008 estimates of the average CO emissions from idling U.S. vehicles in three categories, 71 grams per hour, that's the whole vehicle, not just uh, you know, per horsepower. That's the whole engine for truck, for cars, 152 for trucks, and 301 for motorcycles. Given that EPA has been working with CPSC staff on this since 2006, I don't think this is a coincidence. It begs an explanation. I can't find anybody at CPSC staff or EPA who can explain it. Why is CPSC only proposing to lower CO to the average level of U.S. vehicles when vehicles are still the number one cause of CO deaths and poisonings. You wouldn't know this reading CPSC staff reports because since they don't have jurisdiction, they never mention those numbers. But they still cause more deaths than the generators. So 90% is nice, but it's not enough. And I urge you to find out where these limits actually came from because they're clearly not technically based. My last concern is the staff's dismissal of shutoff devices mounted on generators. They, they had numerous vulnerabilities. But uh, they didn't allow the public to look at this data for eight years. They sat on that report for eight years. It took two years after I filed a FOIA to get it. And the report shows some remarkable findings. Um, even though they only used UL2034 home CO alarms hardwired to the generator, a purpose for which they're explicitly not meant to be used, right? They're not even supposed to be in the same room as a CO source. They still worked perfectly. They took 13 to 14 minutes to shut off generators when they were over 400 ppm. The UL limit allows 4 to 15 minutes. And when they were in the range of 150 to 400 ppm in the, in the room, they took 40 to 49 minutes. And that, again, is within the uh, 15 to 50 minutes allowed. Most importantly, and this goes to uh, Commissioner Robinson's question about what evidence do we have, this test is the evidence. There were no false positives or false negatives indoors or out. It worked perfectly. The staff never tested any commercially available CO detectors designed to control relays, such as the $5 devices installed in uh, vehicles with electronic climate control. Uh, these are meant to last over 10 years, don't need any recalibration. And I point, as someone else already has, to the low oil shutoff sensors in these devices. They very uh, reliably protect generator engines. We need a high CO shutoff to protect generator operators. 
Uh, here is the CPSC staff version on the left, and on the right is one of these small CO modules inside a BMW controlling your HVAC, opening and closing it in response to CO levels on the road. These are extremely robust devices. They're all smaller than your thumb. Uh, they're extremely uh, robust. Um, I don't think they're all metal oxide anymore. They were originally. But just to show you that if they can survive 10 years under the hood of a car on the road anywhere from Arizona to Alaska, I think they can survive 10 years on a generator. Summary of reasons to vote against the rule. Uh, it's crazy to raise the emission limits for larger generators. Um, we should be deferring to EPA to lower them all. Uh, even if we achieve the 90% reductions after they warm up, they're still allowed to emit unlimited CO for 20 minutes. And if misused indoors, they will still poison people. They will not prevent a single case of poisoning if the generator is brought indoors. Staff presented no evidence that consumers will be less likely to bring these low CO generators indoors. And the rule doesn't give manufacturers the best option of putting a fail-safe CO sensor that would prevent all deaths, and I said even all poisonings, uh, into <clears throat> these devices as an alternative. But this is done with other things. I leave you with this analogy. CPSC doesn't make electric outlets safe uh, under wet conditions by requiring them to lower their voltage or current. Where there's a hazardous water condition, we have a fail-safe GFI outlet. It instantly interrupts the circuit. And users are inconvenienced by losing power and having to reset it, but that's a price we're all willing to pay. Another analogy is CPSC doesn't make water heaters safer for consumer use. Rather, you do make them safer by setting a maximum limit on the water temperature. But this only works when you set that temperature limit below the hazard. It wouldn't work if you set the temperature at 190 degrees. It works because you set it uh, at 140 or less. Um, my parting question to you is, why did CPSC spend all these millions of dollars, take 10 years to prove, develop this unproven, expensive, complicated approach that won't work during cold starts, has many critical parts that could fail without warning, an approach the staff has estimated would only prevent about a third of recent deaths without ever even testing a simple proven fail-safe $5 CO sensor that's been installed in over 100 million vehicles in the last 15 years with no reported failures or recalls. I know the answer to this question. The staff never heard of it, and they didn't do a Google search to look for them. Um, thank you. I appreciate any questions, and I appreciate, again, the opportunity. Thank you all very much. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now um, begin the uh, questioning from the commissioners. Again, we'll have uh, two rounds of five minutes, and I will begin that questioning. Um, Mr. Moses, with regards to uh, Generac, in your um, points here in your testimony, you talk about faster implementation. I'd like to, first of all, ask you, do you have any concerns with the timing or the effective date of our standard pursuant to our package? And then um, what you're saying here is that you could there could be, if it was with shut off technology, there would be a faster implementation of the technology? Yes. Yes. Um, the comments are our first uh, portion of your question uh, relative to concerns with the timing. We do have concerns with that. Uh, as we mentioned, or I mentioned earlier in the, uh, the testimony, we have a very wide portfolio of products, um, over 25 different engines. To implement a low uh, CO or EFI slash catalyst type option, would require uh, quite a bit of redesign on the products, in some cases very significant redesign due to packaging constraints, uh, as well as dealing with heat loads with that type of a system, uh, the amount of testing, et cetera, that we'd have to go through. Um, it's unlikely we would be able to complete it in the, the time allowed in the NPR. Um, the uh, shutdown solution is something that is much simpler. Uh, I believe that was brought up this morning as well. Um, so the implementation would be much quicker. Uh, in terms of designing it in uh, either as an accessory or as a, a built-in uh, part of the machine. Thank you. And then I have one other question with regards to your testimony. Uh, some of the concerns, the number one concern here, and I'm not necessarily saying it's your number one concern, but it was the one first listed. Could startup engine choking logic, which typically runs um, the engine rich, can you just explain that and is that uh, relevant to the issue that Mr. Denae brought up with uh, yes. regards to cold startup. 
Yes, yes, it is. Um, essentially, what uh, he had pointed out, as, as well as what we had in our testimony, is that at startup, um, in order to get the engine started, the uh, air fuel mixture would be rich, which typically would create excessive CO relative to, uh, say, running lean, where you've got um, a warmed up engine. Uh, most of our generators are designed to run uh, at lean are more along the lines of a stoichiometric, uh, which is kind of in between. But uh, it points it does does have to run rich when the engine is cold, and so you're producing excessive CO. Thank you very much. Mr. Dene, um, you also brought up the cold start um, issue, and you mentioned that um, the uh, NIST study uses a 60-minute so the engine runs for 60 minutes, and then they begin measuring. You mentioned that our NPR uses 20 minutes. When would you, adv uh, when would you advise that you should begin measuring the CO output? From the moment you turn on the engine, I was told by uh, people at NIST that this was too hard to model, that there was too much variety among the engines they looked at. To me, that's the reason you should require them to test and see what happens. But we know this problem is unsolvable in the, in the real world, and it's just a, a great reason to look for another solution. The people who are exposed to CO begin to be poisoned the moment they inhale it. There's no threshold below which it's safe, except the level that's already in their own body. We all begin to absorb CO when it exceeds the level in our body, and most of us have less than 10 or 20 ppm in our, in our body. Even smokers are under 100. So above that level, they'll start absorbing right away. And as I mentioned, their COHB will go up uh, much higher than it would if there was no cold start. Thank you very much. Mr. Johnson, you also talked about exposure and the, um, really the compromise to one's cognitive skill abilities as they're being exposed to the carbon monoxide. So in terms of technology, whether it's shut off or low emission, would you would you have a preference in terms of if, if someone you, you've said quite eloquently, I would say that um, it's nonspecific, the, the consumer doesn't realize there's CO uh, to intoxication, they begin to have impaired judgment and issues. It would seem to me, and, and I don't know whether you'll agree with me or not, that the shutoff technology, which takes the consumer out of the equation, would be preferential. And I'd like to hear your comments on that. I thought Mr. Soule's testimony um, today was very persuasive on that issue, as well as what he said over the break. And we asked him specifically about the cold start, and he said it was about two minutes. That's 10 percent of what Mr. Donnay is expressing concerns about. And I do think that a, a two-minute period is insufficient in most situations to get the poisoning into a level that it would be clinically significant. Um, I, I think both, as Dr. Weaver said, both. Um, especially if the shutoff is not a terribly expensive add-on. But the goal is to get the emissions down, and we've been getting emissions down in automobiles since I was in high school. There's no reason for this. Thank you very much, Mr. Johnson. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. And again, thank all of you for taking time out of very busy schedules to come and testify. We really appreciate it. Uh, so, Mr. Moses, I think you're the first, third person here who's talked about this impediment to getting the materials from Nest, the $8,000. Uh, why should the taxpayers have to spend that money? Uh, surely, even an impoverished, organ impoverished organization like PGMA could scare up $8,000 if this were so critical. Could you please explain why this hasn't been done? Well, I, th I think the bigger issue is uh, the fact that, at least my understanding, and, and I'm a little removed from, from the, uh, the request, but my understanding is that it was not uh, stated that we would explicitly get everything we were asking for. There was some question, you, you, you're going to get some information, but it may or may not be everything you need. I, th I think that's the bigger concern. Okay, that's a new a new twist on it, but that, uh, at least in terms of the $8,000, I would plead with all of you to reach down into petty cash and help uh, PGMA get this information. Um, one of the things that, uh, that I'm concerned about is the sensors for these machines will not be remote sensors, which is the technology, Mr. Scheibler, I'm going to come and ask you about this, but these would be sensors actually on the generator. Has PGMA or has Generac itself thought about trying to set 
even if the sensors remain on the generator, remote sensors, because if you have a generator that's 40 feet away and a generator that's 10 feet away, if you've got the shutoff technology, it's going to shut them both off uh, under either circumstance, even though one might not be hazardous at all. Sure, no, I understand. Um, I, I, I haven't been with the company a tremendously long time, so there may have been some exploration of the remote sensors. Um, since I joined the company and have been uh, working with this, we, it's primarily been focused on the onboard type sensor. And I think what we've seen from our testing is that uh, even if the generator is positioned, um, you know, in different locations, different scenarios, um, by setting the limits carefully and, and making sure you've got the correct type of an algorithm to to uh, watch what it's sensing, uh, we feel confident that we're still able to uh, to detect when the CO potentially could be building up elsewhere just by watching the proximity of the generator. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Shively, I was extremely impressed by your testimony because you uh, seem to have real-life experience with uh, the shutoff approach to uh, uh, generator issues. Uh, the first question I have is that when you're putting a, uh, uh, a shutoff device and a sensor on a boat or a tent, those are remote sensors, is that correct, removed in distance from the generator itself? Do you have any where you actually attach the sensor and the shutoff device directly to the generator? Any experience with that? Yeah, the, um, uh, in the case of the boat, uh, the, the CO detector is located in the, you know, area where the, the galley... The cabin and, and is what the, I would yeah, call it. The but yeah, the cabin. Um, and the, the uh, generator is in the engine room. So that is a remote sensor. Um, and then we have the capability of tying sensors together. And then in series with that, we tie it, we, we connect up to the generator. So if any sensor goes into alarm, that it will turn off the generator. Yeah, that, that actually isn't my question. My question is, do you have experience with the sensor directly attached to the generator and only to the generator? Yeah, only to the generator. Um, that is what the, the tent manufacturer was doing. Uh, because it was a military, um, you know, type of venture, we, we, we did not get too close to that. But they were actually mounting it on board their generator. Yeah, you said on board, and I wasn't clear what the term on board meant. You, it was attached directly to the generator That's of the correct. sort. That, yeah, okay, thank you. And the other question I had is, uh, you've moved from metal oxide to electrochemical, uh, and I'm wondering if you've seen any problems with electrochemical, uh, and it's that same issue of they're going to go from minus 30 degrees to 100 plus degrees, and this could be over the course of months. And have you done tests on the reliability, in particular, the durability of these sensors? Uh, yeah, we just uh, completed the uh, marine section of that test uh, for, the, for our new detector coming out. And um, that temperature range is minus 30 to plus 70 is the range that, that it will operate in, um, and it's tested to. Um, the next step is to do the RV testing, and that will take it from a minus 40 C to a plus 70 C. Uh, C as opposed to F. That's correct. Okay. Thank you very much. Commissioner mm -hmm. Robinson. Mr. Shively, um, I am fascinated by your experience for the simple reason that I think your success in your limited applications explains precisely what my problem is with the sensor and shutoff. Now, on the, in the, so you're at this point, you're involved in boats and tents. That's it, right? That is our primary business, yes. Okay, and how big of boats have you, have you worked with? I mean, do you work with the mega yachts? Yes. Okay, so have you done studies with respect to migration of carbon monoxide? Uh, we have not. What we typically do is... Um, uh, we in, in where there's multiple accommodation spaces, then uh, there are certain regulations for how many C CO detectors and, and detection uh, devices that are required. So, um, so you all, I'm sorry to interrupt, but if, so if you have multiple spaces on the boat where there will be occupants, let's say bedrooms, you will have a, a sensor in each of those, right? That's correct. And then it'll be wired to the generator, right? That is that is how. There are several applications that way, yes. Okay, because the only way that you know of, obviously you're not going to, on a boat, put it on the generator because it's in a closed environment. It'll shut the generator down, right? Correct. Okay, so if you put the sensors outside, it's 
wired to the generator, what you're doing is you're trying to put a sensor wherever people might be exposed to carbon monoxide. Is that fair to say? That's correct. Okay. And on the tent where you've got the sensor on the generator, you've got a very limited space. So if the generator's getting enough carbon monoxide that it's sensing that it would be dangerous to human being, it's in the same space, correct? That's correct. Okay. Have you, have you worked with any applications where you've got the sensor on the generator, but the carbon monoxide could migrate to spaces quite a distance away from the portable generator? Uh, we do not. Okay. Um, and uh, one other thing, uh, I'm assuming, have you, well, let me just ask you, have you worked at all with tamper resistance? I don't think you'd need to in the boat environments because people aren't going to tamper with something because you're not going to get nuisance shutdowns. But I just wonder if you've had situations where you've worried about a nuisance shutdown such that people might tamper with any of your devices. Yeah, it, nuisance alarms are, are certainly something that, that are a concern. Um, and in many CO deaths that have happened in Marine that I've actually investigated, um, because of older t sensor technology and um, sensors get contaminated that, um, you know, they false alarm. So what happens is that people bypass them and they don't wake up the next day. So They you think they're getting a false alarm, but they're really sensing CO. So the... Um you, you talked about the new CO detectors that you're working on. But the, what we've talked about in terms of a detector on the generator um, applies to the new one too, right? Or you, is it just in the marine environment that you're working for the, on the no, new one? No, we, we're, okay. we're, we're currently working with a, um, a generator manufacturer, and we're using the electrochemical, which is the new style, right. which are, is less susceptible to contamination and a lot of the other issues. Um, and... You know, with, with that one, um, it is... Um, but what's the, what's the venue in which you're going to use it? Are you going to use it RVs, Marines? Nope. on a portable generator. Sorry? On a portable generator. On a portable generator. Where's the generator going to be used? The generator would be operated outside. Okay. Um, Mr. Moses, I met with a lot of the people from PGMA probably two years ago, and uh, it may have been a year ago. Um, and never heard, of, and I was pushing, pushing, pushing for anything that you guys would do to make generators safer, and all I was hearing about was warnings, and now we're hearing about these sensors and shutoffs. When did you guys start working on this? Um, again, I've only been with the company a short time, but I believe uh, we really started um, focusing fairly heavily on this uh, last year. Okay. How long have um, you been with the company? Uh, about 11 months. Okay, so the, so my conceptually, my problem is I cannot fathom how you're going to get a portable generator with a sensor on the generator that is going to shut down the generator when carbon monoxide has migrated to a separate part of the, an arena at a wedding, a separate part of the house, a bedroom, how that's going to like intuitively know at the generator level that somehow, and you use some phrase that you can tell what the CO level is just based on proximity to the generator. That doesn't make any sense to me. Maybe you can help well, me Well, it's out. based on the settings and, and what type of an algorithm you're using in the sensor in terms of what you're sensing and where you're trying to shut the machine down. But, what, what I would suggest is uh, because there's a lot of detail that I either am not in a position to share uh, at this point or, or probably not the right person to share, um, at the uh, technical summit and then also at the closed meeting that has been proposed, um, Generac present much more information behind the testing that we have done. Because I think once you see that, I think you'll feel uh, or at least understand better what we're, we're talking about. Okay. I'm way over my time. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Moses, can you give us a rough, rough approximation, please, of how many what percentage of the market is covered by PGMA, PGMA membership? Do you know that? Uh, I do not know that. No. Any sense off the top of your head? Uh, no. I'm, again, as I said, I'm relatively new to the industry, and uh, I'm not real sure what, what that percentage would be. So let me ask you this. Do you, is it your understanding that every single portable, portable generator that is uh, sold in the United States is sold by a PGMA member? 
Uh, I do not know that for sure. Okay, Let, let's just assume for the sake that it's not, that there are imports coming from overseas. Uh, Does that sound fair? Sure, that's probably safe. <laughs> Are you, if it turns out that the sensor technology is a viable option and addresses the hazard, mm -hmm. are you comfortable with the commission locking that into a mandatory standard from a competitiveness standpoint? Uh, I think uh, that if the playing field is equal, mm -hmm. then yes. Uh, I don't think we have an issue with that. Okay, so the issue here is not a philosophical one of voluntary standard versus mandatory standard. It's the, it's, and I'm asking you, I'm not putting words in your mouth, it's making sure we get it right. Uh, I agreed. I think that's what uh, was expressed this morning uh, in some of the comments. We, we at Generac want to make sure that we provide the best, safest solution. Okay, and I appreciate that because Mr. Wishstad, and maybe he was speaking on behalf of PGMA, he expressly asked that we pause the rulemaking while PGMA moves forward. Well, I, I think, and I understand that, and I think I had the, the same comment in here as well because I I think there is still more that we need to understand in terms of the application of the sensors. Um, so again, we offer the best solution. Um, we want to make sure that what we're doing is, one, safe, two, um, is cost effective for the consumers. Um, if we just throw technology at a machine, ultimately we potentially can price it out of the market and then uh, you know, there's, there's no uh, advantage there. So I think we're saying the same thing. We want time to make sure we understand what is that best solution, which would then be proposed through the PGMA. And one of the areas, again, let me make sure I got this right, was you said you didn't want to have, I think you said, duplication of efforts. Right. Is that, is that right. accurate? And those efforts that you're talking about duplicating are the efforts in PGMA versus the CPSC's efforts? So two different entities uh, trying to address this hazard simultaneously? There's some of that as well as uh, potential duplication of effort between industries because we may be going after different ways to solve the same problem. If, if we can have a, uh, a clear focus on what it is we're going after, then we can work together more effectively. Got it. And do you have the same concern about duplication of efforts of PGMA duplicating efforts or doing efforts on top of what UL is already doing? Uh, there are some concerns there, yes. And are you comfortable then, or would you recommend that Generac have PGMA stand down and let UL complete its work first? Uh, actually, I think we'd prefer the other way. <laughs> but didn't UL start first? Didn't UL, uh, I and I realize so. you're new to this. Sure, but sure, it, but my I, understanding is the direction they're going in. Um, I, I believe where PGMA is going is uh, a more comprehensive look at things. And what are you basing that on? Uh, what I've heard in terms of what the UL activities are, focusing on a particular test method. So you're not basing it on hazard patterns that are being addressed, you're just talking about solutions that might be off being offered? I'm trying to understand uh, when you say more fo comprehensive. Focus of the effort, I should say, in terms of what the ultimate deliverable, deliverable would be. Do I think you, the PGMA standard covers a broad range of items. Items meaning products? Product, performance, safety, et cetera. There, there's uh, a lot of good um, standards, if you will, in there. I see. And do you have a sense as to, can you explain to me the hazard patterns that the proposed PGMA standard would address? Uh, no, I'm probably not the right you person cannot to explain, explain that. that, no. Okay. And in your list, in your testimony, you had a list of items that all, in essence, and I would love to have more time to get to Mr. Santos for his comment on it. Maybe we will. A long list of items that appeared to be concerns about limitations in your mind or Generac's mind about the performance of EFI technologies and incorporating catalysts as well. Right. What did you base that on? Uh, I think a lot of this is based on uh, current industry technology testing. Um, I, I believe the team that uh, has been working on this for some time now uh, has reference to industry reports, et cetera. So that's, that's where essentially this comes from. Do you have specific Generac tests that would validate these concerns? Uh, I know in some cases we do, and again, I think that's information we can share either the technical summit or during the visit. Um, for instance, the cold startup uh, running rich, producing more CO, we have done tests where we show that, um, where that is happening. Um, my, yeah, my time is expired. I would just ask sure. that you submit that as part of the comment period. I don't think that's okay, proprietary sure. data. That's just test data that would be valuable, sure. valuable for the commission to validate what you've said here. Sure. Thank you. Commissioner Horovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Thank you to the entire panel for your contributions to today's hearing. Um, I have a couple of questions. I have a question for uh, beginning with 
Mr. Moses, I want to talk about the product service life of the different uh, generators that would be subject to the proposed rule. Um, generally speaking, I know there are different classes, but what is the product service life for your products? Um, I'm not sure that specifically, again, uh, being relatively new to the industry, but I know we anticipate the products being used up to as much as 10 years or more. 10 years or more? Right. Okay. Uh, I think our staff mentioned 10 to 15 years, which uh, gives me a little bit of concern, uh, Mr. Shively. I think I heard you mention that with the electrotechnical, uh, electrochemical type sensors at a 7 to 10 year uh, product service life for those particular kinds of sensors. Is that, did I hear that correctly? Yes, that's, that is correct. 7 to 10 would be the expected life and, um, you know, it, it certainly is a, would be an easy change in the field as a replacement part. I know if my neighborhood is any indicator in terms of the product service life of many of the generators used in the Glen Ellen area, they, uh, they do surpass 10 years to the industry's credit. But if the sensors are going to last 7 to 10 years and the generator is going to last more than 10 years, either they have to start making worse products or you've got to start making a better product if we're going to rely on that to mitigate the hazard. Do you have any uh, thoughts in terms of uh, what you might be able to do uh, given an expansive market if, in fact, this was a viable alternative to meet a mandatory performance standard and, therefore, it would, um, it, it, it would uh, be rational for you to make those kind of investments in the technology to make them to expand the product service life? Right. The electrochemical um, sensor, um, it actually has a liquid inside. So as it's operating and, and as it is after it has been installed, um, what happens is that electrolyte starts to um, evaporate, and when it evaporates to the point where it's gone, um, then it will give you a signal saying that I'm entering end of life. Um, and that's really the limitation of the sensor itself as opposed to how we are incorporating it into a overall detector. That's a limitation of the sensor itself. Okay, I'll allow Mr. Donne. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shively. Thank you. I think the answer you're looking for is maybe that these can be installed in a fail-safe manner. So whether someone temper, tampers with them or they reach end of life, they'll lock out the generator. Problem solved. I mean, they're going to see that their generator doesn't work. They'll call the 800 number. They'll take it to a repair place, and they'll learn, oh, you need a new CO sensor. Okay. Thank you very much. That's all the questions I had. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll begin now round two of our questions. Um, Mr. Dene, when I talked about cold start and I addressed it with you as well as Mr. Johnson and on the panel this morning as well, um, Mr. Johnson didn't take what you were saying seriously about the 10 percent um, and the amount with a cold start, the amount of CO emissions that can occur during that period of time either prior to 20 minutes or up, up to 60 minutes. Do you want to comment on that or do you want to explain? I'll, I'll give you no cold start. Pretend it didn't happen. Just expose human beings to the emissions from the perfectly working uh, modified generator. If it's allowed to emit the same level of CO as the average of vehicles, cars, trucks, motorcycles, it won't prevent any poisonings because when cars, trucks, and motorcycles are run in garages, usually accidentally left on, the occupants of the home die. They don't have to die in the garage sitting in the car. The CO is effectively transported through the house. And to answer uh, Commissioner Robinson's concern about that, if the CO sensor is working on the machine, it may not be the first one in the room to go off. But as the staff testing found, even when it was over 1,000 ppm in one corner of the room, the unit on the generator still shut it off within the CPSC UL limits, and if you lower those limits, the detector will respond appropriately. There doesn't have to be even two minutes of poisoning. And I don't understand why we would uh, completely allow the cold start when we can prevent any exposure at all. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Moses, I, I want to go back to uh, the line of questioning uh, from Commissioner Kay with regards to ULs um, in the development of their, it's, is it a standard or did you say it was a test? Uh, my understanding was it was a standard that um, focused on 
testing. On the testing. So but do you want to explain just a little bit? I was getting ready to say I'm, I'm probably not very qualified to get much deeper than that into that. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Johnson, I just wanted to know um, when you're talking about oxygen levels, and, and, and this goes to your um, experience with carbon monoxide, carbon monoxide poisoning, maybe you could speak to how a reduced oxygen level or that environment would affect the consumer, say at um, 15 to 18 percent levels of oxygen? Well, the issue is is not the reduction in oxygen, it's the increase in carbon monoxide because of carbon monoxide's greatly enhanced capacity to bind to hemoglobin and then it's great, much greater capacity for the cells to grab it off of the blood as it goes through than oxygen. Um, rarely um, do we have people um, asphyxiated because they don't have enough oxygen in the room they're breathing air in. It's because the carbon monoxide takes the place of the oxygen when it reaches the cell. With respect to some of the comments made by Mr. Dene, he says we would have no reduction in deaths, yet we've had an 80 percent reduction of deaths with respect to automobiles and carbon monoxide. Um, at one point he said there was a one-third reduction and then he said there was no reduction, so I don't understand. He takes this attitude that one um, drop, so to speak, of carbon monoxide is going to kill us and that's just not the case. Um, it is a gradient and well, I wouldn't want to say that no harm could come from um, a carboxyhemoglobin, any measurable carboxyhemoglobin level. The reality is that the greater the level, the greater the harm up to it may start to, you may start to have a, a convergence of problems when you get above a 10 percent. But there's a lot of evidence that would indicate that if the highest level never got above 5 percent, that it would not likely have the kind of morbidity we see now. And we're talking about a 90 percent reduction. And that should translate to a 90 percent reduction of the carboxyhemoglobin levels. Thank you. Thank you very much for that answer. I, um, I think probably one of the complications of that matter is that as the carbon monoxide level rises, the, as you mentioned earlier, the cognitive abilities and the awareness of the, of the consumer is affected. I, I, my time is almost up. I just want to comment on one thing, and that is Commissioner Adler and the NIST data. Um, my only concern is the, the, the taxpayer has already paid for, we paid NIST to do a study for us, and so they've done their fair share and we're not asking. Um, I, I think that NIST owes us the data as well as anyone else who's FOIA'd that. Um, yes, uh, NIST has done the work for us, but uh, they're asking for that work and there is this thing called the Freedom of Information Act which also permits government that's developed information when somebody makes a request um, and this must be thousands and thousands of pages that they get some degree of reimbursement that's specifically set forth in the Freedom of Information Act so I'm not I'm not exactly sure what the point is other than maybe I've heard a plea that we abolish costs uh, reimbursement for the Freedom of Information Act. My um, time has expired. Okay. Commissioner Adler. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Santos, first of all, thank you for your testimony and I didn't want to leave you unaddressed uh, with questions. So I, I do know that on, notice on page four of your testimony, you refer to the ingenuity of engine manufacturers in developing new advanced design for certain small spark ignited engines to meet phase three, tier three standards without the use of catalysts. And I was wondering if you could explain what this technology is and whether we're near to see seeing it widespread. Um, uh, sorry. Oh. That reference is to, in general, um, mm -hmm. so the standards that were set uh, back uh, when EPA and both ARB in California set their, their tier three, the tighter standards that are currently in place for small class one and class two uh, handheld and non-handheld engines. Um, the expectation, I think, at the time was that um, the standards could be met through the use of catalyst technology and electronic fuel injection. But it's turned out over time in the 10 years that the standards that were set, and we can debate whether or not we consider them to be stringent enough, both for HC plus NOx and CO, were and are being met by several manufacturers working with engine manufacturers uh, without the use of catalysts. So my comment was to acknowledge that that has been the case through engine calibration and, and, and um, without having to use emission control technology, the standards themselves um, aren't, weren't forcing enough uh, to, to require the use of catalysts. Um, so a lot of test work was done 
to support that, to say that you could meet these lower through the use of catalysts, but the, in the end, the standards that were set um, and through the ingenuity of the engine manufacturers working with the, the generator manufacturers were able to meet these. And I think what you've just done is to underscore the wisdom, uh, not to say the necessity of doing it as a performance standard. So we're not saying you must use EFI and you must use catalytic converters, just you must get your levels uh, below a certain amount. So I guess another fair question to ask for an emission control group is what do you think about uh, the shutoff approach that PGMA is suggesting? Do you have any reservations or uh, any yeah, approval it, of it? Yeah, uh, in listening to the conversation this morning and, and today I was thinking about that and whether that would be, I mean, I, we came here today as MECA to support CPSC and, 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 and specifically that the conclusions they came to within their NPR that uh, these uh, uh, CO standards could be met through the use of readily available technology, um, that we agree with that. I, I did actually personally, and we, we have not talked within Mika, within our member companies, with our staff, how we directly feel about the option that's being discussed about shutoff and whether one or the other or both, except to say that the technology is available to meet the standards that uh, are currently being proposed. By I'll students. hazard a guess that that conversation probably will take place after today's <laughs> well, hearing. Well, given the fact that you've requested it before we've ever written <laughs> yeah, comments, uh, you might come back. And I guess one other stronger. question I have is that you talked about EPA standards and you talk about CPSC standards, and we have been told that you can't meet both, that they would directly contradict. Uh, do you have any view as to whether it's possible to meet the EPA standard and to meet the if it goes into effect, the proposed CPSC standard? Well, the EPA standards are currently being, well, the, the, the standards have been in effect for a while, and the engines that are being certified are currently meeting the HC plus NOx and CO standards. And so what uh, uh, CPSC uh, is proposing with this in-use operating uh, level, um, we are just echoing that it could be met similarly with the same technologies that were being uh, tested and demonstrated to be met to, to, to meet the, the Tier 3, Phase 3 standards. Um, I don't really see necessarily see a conflict there in terms of, uh, I mean, I'm not going to get into the legality that was No, not the legality. I was talking as, the technical as, as feasibility. Well. Uh, but from the technical feasibility point, we are here to support the fact that both very specifically in the work that was done by CPSC, the work that was done by ARB and EPA, as well as Southwest Research Institute that I, that I cited, as well as the work that's been done within our member companies specifically, and then in general, which we've referred to by others as well, about the work that's been done with catalyst technology, not just with portable generators, but with uh, the latest and greatest state-of-the-art is currently on passenger cars being certified out in California. And these issues we've talked about uh, with, with light off, um, which by the way, uh, there's some confusion about the time frames. I mean, I, light off is an issue and it's being addressed, and, and actually to address it, but also the generate comments about catalysts. Um, no one within Mika would not acknowledge that there are concerns with the use of catalyst technology on spark ignited engines. The, the point that it's being made in a general sense is that whether it's packaging, durability, uh, poisoning, uh, that they're all being met and have been met and proven to be met through these demonstration programs as well as what's currently in the market today for, for these other sources and sectors, whether it's light duty, heavy duty, spark uh, uh, forklifts, uh, uh, weed whackers and, and lawnmowers. Um, and that, that, that is sort of where we come from to, to make the point within our testimony that the technology is available to, to uh, address and, and meet the CEO proposed standards. Well, thank you for talking so fast. And I've been trying to listen fast, but my, <laughs> my time has okay. expired. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. Thank you. Um, I confess that as I've, as I've circled this issue for a really long time now that I am getting the lights up constantly on how people actually use portable generators as somebody who's never used one. And Mr. Johnson, you have represented a number of clients um, who have uh, suffered from carbon monoxide poisonings with various uses. And I wonder if you could just discuss some of the different circumstances in which people suffer from carbon monoxide poisoning. Well, in addition to what's been documented with respect to gener generators, um, probably the other largest segment of it, it is some type of malfunctioning HVAC system. The school cases, um, one was a um, improper um, obstruction of the intake air for a boiler that was heating the, the building. Another one was a, a hot water heater that the pipe um, had rusted through. Um, the hotel was inability to get enough fresh air for the furnaces when they were running. Um, you know, bank building, similar type problems. So it's, it's usually in a building, in a static type building, HVAC, it, it has something to do with the absence of enough oxygen 
to make sure that the, that the, the exhaust flows properly through the system. So you talked about this wetting um, that you had a number of people who were poisoned at it. Was it were these portable generators that were being used Yeah, they used were four, um, uh, you know, three kilowatt um, brought into a wetting. The um, band apparently needed higher capacity electrical um, demands for their amplifiers than what the building was willing or able to provide them. And they went out and rented four generators, took them inside. Now, the, one of the most important parts of that story is that the warnings are in English and none of the people involved in that poisoning spoke very good English. Um, and even though there's pictures, uh, I don't think the pictures work very well without uh, language. And if we're going to have warnings that don't warn in all the languages we know that our people speak, and especially the kind of people who are more likely to have that need um, in an emergency situation, the warnings aren't going to be very effective. And were these rented generators? Yes, they were rented. Okay. Um, do you have an opinion about, uh, you know, uh, candidly, um, uh, up until very, very recently, all I've been hearing from many members uh, in, of the of industry is that warnings are sufficient. And I just wonder if you have an opinion as to whether they are sufficient. Well, in the hierarchy of safety, warning should always be the last option. Um, you should either eliminate the hazard, guard against it, which I think we we have two options. A, lowering the emissions is eliminate, um, warn against it would be the shutoff. And the, the warning is, is the worst of that options. If you can't eliminate and you can't guard against it, then you warn. Um, we can do both of those other things. We should not rely on warnings, especially warnings that are only in English. And when you're talking about the rental situation, you're talking about people who have probably never used a generator before. Um, and we don't talk as much about carbon monoxide as we did when I was a kid when we had all these EPA requirements and we had smog and all of these things in our cities. I'm not sure that the 20-year-olds or the 15-year-olds or the 30-year-olds even understand what carbon monoxide is because it's not part of our public conversation like it used to be. And have you ever seen any warnings that really communicate the incredible danger of portable generators in terms of carbon monoxide? I mean, I was shocked, and whenever I've spoken with people anecdotally and said how many hundreds of times the carbon monoxide that a portable generator puts out um, compares with what an idling automobile puts out, I always am met with shock. But I just wonder if you've ever seen a warning that actually tells people how incredibly dangerous these well, are. If I followed my father into engineering these types of generators, which is what he did for his career, I wouldn't be very happy knowing that I would, that little picture on the side of the generator was the only protection that I was going to have, my product was going to have from this kind of mortality and morbidity. And my last question for you is, could you tell us the range of long-term effects that you've seen from carbon monoxide poisoning where there isn't severe brain injury? Well, define severe brain injury. I, if you're going to talk about severe brain injury and the kind of thing that puts a person in a coma, which I think is that's a good point. Um, most carbon monoxide people, those who survive, are awake within hours, if not by the time they're evacuated. Um, so they falls into what might can be considered a mild to moderate category for brain injury. But the disability, especially when you're talking about mood and behavior, is, is perhaps more severe than with traumatic brain injury. I think it has a more systemic wide system. It, it seems to impact more things than a specific traumatic brain injury might. Um, and because it affects so many things and also affecting the organs, I think it has an overall greater cumulative disability than even what we see um, in fairly um, mod towards the moderate side of the mild brain injury spectrum. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Johnson, Jr., I appreciated earlier during your testimony, I appreciated very much your mention of chronic exposure, and I thought it was a great analogy to the subconcussive hits that are going on in sports. I don't think that we have a mechanism, from my perspective, to properly capture that those type of incidents because that's not likely getting reported, for instance, through an emergency department or even a physician's office. And so whatever data you have related to that, I would just request, please, that you submit that as part of this open rulemaking. The issue of chronic has not been studied nearly as much as those who've been hospitalized. Um, and in most cases, the chronic people don't realize what's happening when they're blood levels are actually positive, so it's much more difficult to categorize. But the studies that have been done have actually showed worse results from those with chronic 
exposures than those with more severe acute ones. And I think the reason is the multiple concussion phenomenon that's going on. We're not sure of the biomechanism because we don't have autopsies of a large group of people like they do with the NFL, but I suspect there may be something similar going on. And I think from our perspective of having a more refined cost-benefit analysis, that would be very important data. Uh, Mr. Shively, can you explain to me, please, or us, help us understand, how do you set the shutoff threshold? What's the trigger for your detector? How, what is that based on? Well, it's, it's based on 10% uh, uh, COHB. So in the UL 2034 standard, your alarm must um, activate depending on the, the, the PPM level that you're seeing in the area. Um, it has to alarm within a given time frame. And so every unit are, is tested to that. You actually subject it to CO and make verify that it does alarm at those various uh, points. Got it. And Mr. Dene, are you comfortable with that threshold from what you've heard? Absolutely at the, at, not. Okay, so. The UL 2034 standard says very clearly in every manual, do not put this detector in a room. I'm sorry. It says the UL 2034 standard says don't put these detectors in garages, furnace rooms, and kitchens where the source is located. They're not designed to, to respond to that. And the specs for all other CO controllers in commercial parking garages, in cars, they instantly trip when their level is exceeded. They don't wait until you're poisoned up to the level of danger. CO poisoning begins the moment you start to inhale CO and absorb it in your tissues. I don't say that that will kill you. I say that poisons you, and I urge you to prevent that because it's easily preventable. So do you have a suggestion, or do you plan to participate in the PGMA process to help them come up with the right threshold? Well, thank you. I proposed 35 ppm in 2006 to the uh, commission in the f comments on the ANPR, and I was correctly, I think, told that that would be too low. I didn't know about the vehicle uh, detectors at the time, and I was citing the standards for commercial parking garages. I thought humans should be protected at least as well as we protect parked cars. Um, I, I'm willing to go up to 200, which is the NIOSH immediate evacuation limit for any workplace. I'm not willing to go to the CPSC 400, uh, the UL alarm standard. Um, I believe that's too high. It doesn't deserve to wait four to 15 minutes at that level. If you were in a workplace, you would be notified and evacuated immediately. So if the cold start concern is legitimate, and I'm not at this point conceding that it is, but or at least the extent of it, and to Mr. Moses's point, the machines have to run rich during cold start from a performance perspective, what, how much poisoning, in essence, will go on to somebody who's exposed to that unit until the threshold is triggered and that shutoff kicks in. I urge you all to think of this very simple analogy, which fortunately is well established. Every breath you take in a CO environment, approximately half of that CO will enter and stay in your body, and half will be exhaled. So the time is very critical. The longer you're exposed, every single breath is adding CO to your blood, and until you reach equilibrium, it doesn't stay in your blood. It goes right through into your tissues. And all together, the tissues and blood rise until they reach the level in air. If it's 1,000 ppm or 10,000 ppm in air, you'll reach that equilibrium in a few hours. But if it's lower, what the CPSC is proposing, if we are down to hundreds of ppm, it will take much, much longer. And the total exposure time and the total absorbed dose may actually be greater. Great. And my last question during this round is, what was the basis of your assertion, please, that CPSC staff was unaware of the, uh, the unit that you said is cheaper than $5 and smaller than a thumb? I had extensive discussions with Chris Brown over the years who did the staff report and who was trying to get it released. And he told me that when they developed the project, their sole focus was to use what they had in the lab, which was 2034 alarms on the shelf, and it just never occurred to them to go look for a commercial device. They, they just weren't aware that they exist, and I myself wasn't aware of them in automobiles, uh, even though they've been there since 2000. But now that we know, I don't think we should ignore them. There's never been a recall or a failure of these devices in automobiles that I know of, and I've checked with auto parts suppliers and say, do you ever sell this part to anyone? No, it doesn't fail. Okay, thank you. I hope to have further rounds. Thanks. 
Thank you, Commissioner Mohorovic. Thank you, Madam Chairman, and I appreciate the discussion. I just wanted to, I don't have any questions myself, but with five panelists and one minute each, I wanted to I'd maybe move from my left to my right in case there was any part of the discussion or a dialogue, uh, Q&A that was uh, taking place, but you felt uh, you weren't fortunate enough to be asked to engage in it. So, Mr. Moses, is there anything else at this point you'd like to add? Not that this might be your last opportunity, sure. but I'm willing to donate it. Uh, no, I think I think uh, based on the comments in my testimony as well as the follow-up questions, I feel like I've uh, said what I can say. Mr. Johnson. Yeah, with respect to your your mic. Please. With respect to Commissioner Kay's question about the levels, the the WHO is a pretty um, comprehensive paper on this. Um, I don't know if it's in your materials or not. I can submit it. On page 87 of 484, they do have indoor guidelines, um, which is 100 parts per million for 15 minutes, 35 for an hour, 10 for 8 hours, and 24 for 7. I don't want anything in my testimony to indicate that I disagree with Mr. Donay about the severity of carbon monoxide poisoning. It's just to use the fact that some poisoning could occur as a justification not to reduce the potential by, by 90 percent. I think is inappropriate. Mr. Johnson, I'll yield to my colleague, Thank Commissioner Kay, to okay. engage. Thank you, Commissioner Morovic. And is that WHO report specific to portable generator as the source? No, this is, this is an indoor carbon monoxide guideline that's published in the, by the WHO, and I think it's their 2013, um, 2010, I'm sorry, paper. I will, I will submit it uh, upon the completion of the hearing. Great. Thank you. Yeah, you're very welcome. Anything else, Mr. Johnson? No, thank you. No, terrific. Mr. Shively? Uh, yeah, th the only thing I'd like to, to say is uh, the, the detector that we currently manufacture, um, we, we do manufacture that to UL 20, 2034, and so there are certain levels that we have to meet. Um, that doesn't say that a detector can't be calibrated to, <clears throat> to alarm at much lower levels, um, but that's currently the standard that we're working with. Um, and as we understand it going forward, um, uh, you know, we can certainly manufacture a detector that would meet the specs, um, I believe, of anything that's coming out. Um, one, one comment to uh, Commissioner Robinson. Um, my understanding is that the, ma the majority of the deaths are caused from CO poisoning in enclosed spaces. The majority. In the case of a shutdown system, that is going to prevent those deaths by turning the unit off, okay? Where you have CO, and, and if it is being pushed by the wind um, to remote areas, you know, a detector on the unit itself is not going to cover all cases. So if it's being operated outside, and if CO does get um, accumulate in a camper, a house, whatever, um, I think the answer is that in all of those areas, they should have CO detectors in those enclosed spaces. And that is the only way that you're going to, you know, prevent CO deaths across the board. You know, reducing CO, uh, levels certainly is going to help. It's not going to eliminate it. But again, the majority of the deaths are because people are not using portable generators properly and they're putting them inside in enclosed spaces. The one he just mentioned today that happened, the one that happened two weeks ago, the one that happened three years ago, it's where CO detect or where, where portable generators are being operated inside of an enclosed space. Thank you. Commissioner Robinson, did you want me to yield? No. Okay. Uh, Mr. Santos? Uh, yeah, I just uh, wanted to echo my previous testimony about uh, technologies being readily really, really available to meet CPSC, CPSC's proposed requirements and that, once again, just to make the point that uh, the type of technology we're talking about is not some uh, unknown black box that needs to be done to, to, to meet these proposed standards, whether it was CPSC's or even EPA ARB's CO standards from 10 years ago, the current phase three, tier three. Um, 
Uh, one, I did want to make one specific comment on Two the. Two seconds. Yeah, uh, sorry. On the the CO uh, shutoff uh, issue was that um, uh, I think relative to the the time frame that these uh, the generators are being used, the CO uh, the the uh, uh, light off time is is minimal. Uh, uh, seconds on, on, on passenger cars and probably at, at, at most a couple minutes on portable generators. So whatever elevated levels you might see in HD plus NOx and mm -hmm. CO Thank you very over much. time would be uh, de minimis. Thank you. Um, so I've had a request from Commissioner Kay that we extend for another round of questions. Uh, first of all, I want to check with the panel to make sure that doesn't conflict with your schedules or your travel plans if you have them and it would affect you. Uh, I will say that we'll have this last round will be three minutes long as we did this morning uh, just so we don't interfere we had a hard stop at 240 in terms of scheduling but um, since we've had this request if you need to leave because of a flight please feel free to do that but we'll just extend this to one last round of three minute questions per commissioner I don't do not have any additional questions so I will uh, ask Commissioner Adler I'm not sure if this is a question or a comment but uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, one of the things that, uh, that I have argued for years is, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate your addressing the economic impact of these injuries and fatalities from generators, is that when we talk about a standard, people are always talking about the increased cost of the product. But they never understand that when you're getting an increased cost of the product, what you're doing is taking uh, costs that are really being externalized. Uh, and imposed on the public in the nature of fatalities or injuries, and you are internalizing them. You're reallocating those costs and putting them in to the costs of the product where they ought to be, so that the manufacturer that's benefiting and profiting from the sale of that product is absorbing the costs of their product and not externalizing them. And frankly, consumers are paying higher prices wh when that occurs because they're getting the benefit of these uh, savings. And so, it's not necessarily going to result in increased societal costs. It's just reallocating the costs. I'm wondering if you have any comment on that observation. Uh, um, my math isn't very good, but, I, but I'll give you a quick summary. If you multiply 10,000 times a million, um, and I don't know if that's a billion or 10 billion, I'm, I think it must be 10 billion. Law school last refuge of the non-mathematical you know, mind, I, and I said, "The problem is I, I pulled out my calculator yeah. and gave it to me an answer that <laughs> couldn't do that many zeros." Um, Forty percent of the people are going to have a million-dollar case. That's how I would look at it. Forty percent are going to be disabled of that twenty-five thousand that got hospitalized. And if you're disabled, it's going to be an average of a million-dollar case. It's probably going to be considerably more than that in most of the cases. And just uh, this again may not be a question, may be an observation. But Mr. Shively, one of the things you said is the necessity for more carbon monoxide detectors, and I'm still struggling to understand why they haven't spread the same way smoke alarms are, because you can buy them in joint units. Um, what do you, would you think about uh, either a requirement or a strong suggestion to the industry that when they sell a portable generator, at a minimum, they include a free or a couple of free CO detectors. Uh, can you see a problem with that concept? Um, no, as a matter of fact, as a manufacturer of them, we would actually kind of <laughs> like that. But, uh, um, but you know, certainly I, I believe that that's the, the thing that people don't get. I mean, I have a generator at my house. I have a CO detector in the garage. I have one on each level of the house. I have it throughout because I understand, okay? Um, but most people do not. So I certainly think that at a very minimum that there is some kind of recommendation that if you are going to operate a generator um, in or around your area that any enclosed space should really have a CO detector installed. I live on the seventh floor of a condominium and my wife insists that we have two CO detectors. So uh, at least Smart I'm lady. keeping you in business. Thank you very much. But Thank you. Commissioner Robinson. In the marine environment where you're dealing with sensors that are in rooms wired to the generator, uh, you're already in a situation where you've got reduced emissions from carbon monoxide because that's required in the marine environment, correct? Yes, that's correct. So you basically got the twofer that everybody's been advocating today. Yes, that's okay. correct. 
Um, Mr. Um, Santos, I, I, you've said you've said that the technology is there, but I want to be very specific about this technology in terms of emissions reducing. Um, adding this requirement that is being proposed in the CPSC NPR, um, the first question is: Would that would it involve significant design changes to most portable generators to meet that standard? Uh, no. Um, and I think that's been demonstrated in what CPSC zone work and the test programs that have been done. And would would these design changes be cost prohibitive? Uh, there would be an incremental uh, cost through the use of a uh, you know, catalyst technology in addition to uh, you know, you know, the engine. Um, I think Mika actually did a uh, uh, when EPA and ARB was were running their test programs ten years ago. But this was on once again older engines. Um, but we estimated at the time. Uh, I believe it was like two to three dollars per horsepower increase. So obviously, the, the, the bigger the engine. And this is just within the the, the small engine uh, uh, world. And do you know what rate of reduction of the CO emissions is feasible? Um, well, the, the the as reported in my testimony, the eighty to ninety percent is what we've seen within our manufacturers. And are these engines testing. reliable? Yes. Safe to operate? Yes. Are there concerns about overheating or hot exhaust? Uh, the concerns that have been raised have been addressed. And um, you were about to say something about the duration of a cold start, and somebody's time ran out. Yeah, sorry. I, was, I just wanted to, when I didn't realize we were making not making last comments, was just to, I, I think I've heard first earlier t this morning, as well as Mr. Dunney and others, talking about cold start and light off, et cetera. I just want to comment from, from our perspective as Mika that the whole catalyst light off issue is an issue, but it is being addressed in terms of they're talking about these elevated emission levels that happen when you first turn on an engine. Um, but that the time frames we're talking about um, are on the order of minutes, and obviously making the assumption typical usage of a portable generator would be over, you know, at a minimum several hours to, to more. So. Um, uh, yeah, so just sort of making that issue that it's not, I, I wasn't quite sure if I was hearing correct that others were raising that it was a much longer duration. I just wanted to, to make sure that it's, it's a small, and even more so on, on the later technology engines like on passenger cars, we're talking seconds. Okay, and are you aware of anyone dying from the, the emissions of carbon monoxide during the starting process? Uh, no, I'm not. Thank you. I have nothing to Thank you. Mr. Commissioner Kay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Diné, I'm just going to finish up quickly with you on where we left off, please, um, which was your explanation that when you spoke with C CPSC staff a number of years ago, they had not looked at the particular technology that you mentioned or that particular component. Uh, I get that you're very passionate about this issue. I get your frustration level. We're passionate. We're frustrated. But I think that your passion and your frustration got a little bit of the best of you by saying that CPSC staff was not aware of it. and hadn't even Googled it. I, I don't think that's a fair characterization of them, and I would just point that out to you. I don't know if you want to add anything else to that. I do. Uh, I can see why you'd be upset about it, but I, I told you I'm telling the truth, and uh, Chris Brown will back me up on that if you can find him. I don't know what agency he's been seconded to, but um, that was the answer I was given. The other staff I'd spoken with, including Janet Byer, they simply were not aware of these technologies. And, I wasn't either. Somebody has to go look for them to yeah, find them. Yeah, and I think in the interim they are aware of it and they felt right. like from a technical perspective there wasn't so much of a difference in the way that that was manufactured or that component was made that based on what they had tested that it was worth going out and purchasing it. But my understanding is they were aware of it. And so I did, I'm just, was concerned about the characterization of their work and the depth of their work and I, I didn't think it was I, I congratulate them for proving that the devices worked perfectly. Fail safe, no false positives or no negatives. My question is why was that not moved forward? Why was that left behind in 2006 for a multi-million dollar program to develop things that are not yet in commercial use. I thought one of the main priorities here was to always encourage staff to look at commercially available off-the-shelf solutions that wouldn't require expensive new designs and engineering. I'm an engineer originally and I go with keep it simple stupid. This is simple. Absolutely, and I'm sure when you submit comments to that effect that the commission, through including the staff, will address those in the comments. Hey, my fear is that the, the time is the real issue, not the level. The longer you're exposed without warning someone, the longer they're absorbing CO. And to stop CO poisoning, you have to stop the duration of exposure. Understood. Uh, Mr. Moses, how quickly will you come to market with units that have the shutoff technology on them? 
Uh, we're still completing our evaluation um, studies, et cetera. Um, it's difficult to give a time frame at this point. We've made good progress to date. We plan to share that, but I can't. I can't give you a definitive schedule. Is it within five years? Would you say? I, I would certainly hope within five years. Hope within yes. five years. And are the from your perspective, are the shutoff technologies and the reduced CO technologies mutually exclusive? Meaning, can a unit only have one or the other from an engineering perspective, or could it have both? No, they, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, there, is, as we discussed this morning, there's an argument whether there is an added benefit or not. Um, if there's negligible benefit and added cost, does it make sense? But they're not mutually exclusive. So there's no reason why you at least won't go forward, especially if PGMA adopts its proposal, regardless of whether reduced CO technologies are also uh, come, to, whether from UL or from us or from anybody else. Uh, assuming we get through all of our evaluation and it's positive and we feel that's the best solution, absolutely. Great. Thank you. I have more questions, but I understand there's no more time. Thank you. Commissioner Horovic? Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. I'll yield uh, my time to Commissioner Kay. Very thank kind you, of you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Shively, so one of the areas that we've been frustrated as a commission in trying to adjust CO, is, and Mr. Johnson Jr. mentioned this earlier, is furnaces. And my understanding is that sensors have proven to be unreliable in that difficult thermal environment. Do you, have you looked at that? And I'm trying to understand if, if you're confident about the functioning of your sensors, why that wouldn't be applicable to furnaces as a shutoff technology. Right. As, as I stated, we've been primarily focused on marine. It, you know, that is our core business. Um, however, over the last few years, we have been expanding. And we're doing uh, methane detection now in the truck and bus market, um, in some of the um, mining equipment. Um, so we're expanding our horizons. One of the things that we did talk about, and, and we've made propane sensors for many years, and we approached that market um, about having some kind of shutoff device and, and detection system. Um, you know, and quite honestly, we really just didn't get anywhere. Um, the product that we're developing uh, along with one of the portable generator manufacturers, um, that certainly could be, could be adapted to that market. Um, and as I said, the, the sensors that we're currently using, there's a, absolutely no issue with temperature swings, humidity swings. Um, so I think it certainly is something that um, could be applicable to that, to that market. It just we, we have not a, a, you know looked at it yet. Great, and obviously I, I think staff would appreciate if, as we continue that work on the furnace side, that if you would engage as well there, because the sensor is the sensor, and it's going to be useful for different applications for us. Sure. Um, and just just yeah, real please, quick, as far as getting it to market, once we understand a specification, we could be looking at six to eight months for high volume ready for market, ready for distribution. Got it. So that's on the generator side or anything? Either. Okay. And Mr. Santos, you heard a long list or during Mr. Moses's testimony of all of the perceived limitations of EFI technologies and why they are not reliable for this application. They basically uh, were summed up as uh, not reliable in wide temperature ranges, uh, Concerns about durability over time and degradation, concerns about needing to run rich and how long it would take for EFI to kick in. Can you address those, please, from your uh, significant experience with these technologies? Uh, yes, I mean, I would, um, I mean, obviously that was an extensive list, and I'm not going to deny that, that, that to some degree that they've, they've seen that. I, I think that the general point that I made earlier is the one that I will lean on again, and that is to say that the, the concerns if we could categorize all of these things under whether they be heat management or durability or potential poisoning, um, that they have been, uh, that, that they are concerns, but that they have been addressed. Um, and um, I think whether that has been demonstrated through the test program that CPSC has already done themselves, the, the work that some of the MECA members, I reported just a little bit of that, we can obviously cite that in our written testimony more about uh, the, the work that's been done that, that demonstrates that these uh, issues have been addressed, whether it be that or lastly the, the work that was done 10, 10 years ago on uh, 
on these small engines back uh, by EPA, ARB, and Southwest to demonstrate all of these, these I'm, I'm not saying they had these lists of concerns and went through and checked all of them um, per se, but in the end they came to the final conclusion that you could install catalysts on these engines and reduce uh, HC plus NOx and CO uh, safely and, and effectively. Um, uh, I, I would just make one, one other comment on, on that cold start issue just quickly is that, I mean, the, the engines have become so clean these days that, that the cold start issue actually um, is, is making more of an impact because that, that elevated level is so, so high relative to how clean engines are once the catalyst kicks in that it's becoming more of an issue. And in fact, when you're looking at that last bit of control on HT plus NOx and CO from Spark United Engines, it is on the cold start front because that, that little bit of elevation relative to how clean these engines run once the catalyst is running optimally and stoichiometric um, is, is now one of the, the main issues that are being uh, investigated with, uh, by the catalyst manufacturers. Good to know. Thank you. And thank you to the rest of the panelists. Thank you very much. Again, uh, our sincere thanks to uh, all of you this afternoon, as well as our panel from this morning, for sharing your expert testimony with us and, and answering our questions and accommodating the request for an extension. So we appreciate that very much. I also want to just thank uh, our staff, uh, Executive Director Patricia Adkins, our uh, General Counsel Mary Boyle, the Office of Secretary Todd Stevenson and Ms. Rocky Hammond, who really um, put this all together and, uh, and bore with us <laughs> during this process. Uh, and last but not least, to John McGugan, who does all of our AV. And uh, we thank all of them for being here today and for supporting this public hearing. This concludes the public hearing of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And again, thank you all very much. <laughs>